right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our presentation on Mastering Malolactic Fermentation. My name is David Spector, and I am the Technical Account Manager for Christian Hansen. I'm responsible for the sales of our wine and beer cultures in the U.S. and Canada. And luckily, I am joined by two of my colleagues. We have Natalia Edwards, who will be leading the technical presentation. She is joining us from Copenhagen, Denmark. And we also have our commercial development manager, Anne Claire, who will be assisting us in our question and answer period at the end of the presentation. Before I go any further, I want to thank our distributor and partner, Guzmer Enterprises. They are hosting us today uh, for this webinar, and I cannot say enough about the partnership uh, that we have with them. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce Christian Hansen and just give you a bit of information about who we are as a company. Christian Hansen is a biotechnology company with the world's largest library of bacteria. Next slide. We may have been around for 145 years, uh, but that doesn't mean that we aren't innovative. Uh, we have been innovative in the fermentation fields of dairy and meat and wine for a very long time. We were the first to bring frozen Enococcus eni to the market, and we are the leader in non-Saccharomyces yeast products. But what it's doing, doing right for the world has to be bound with doing what is right for the company. And that's why we were named the world's most sustainable company in 2019. Uh, we came in second place in 2020, um, but that keeps us among the world's elite when it comes to sustainability. And in a post-coronavirus world, having a strong and robust supply chain is very important to us. Uh, so you, the customer, know that you're going to get the products that you need uh, since we have production facilities in Europe and North America. We all know that environmental yeast and bacteria can carry out uh, the alcoholic and malolactic fermentation, and this certainly can yield great results, but you must understand your vineyard and your winery's microflora if you don't want to leave yourself up to chance. Much of what we're going to be chatting about today is control understanding what microorganisms are coming into the process, and then using commercial strains to help you achieve uh, your desired goals. Our product line for wine is Vinaflora. So we have non-saccharomyces yeast for the pre-alcoholic fermentation. If you want to bioprotect your wine, if you want to differentiate your wine from the competitors, we have two very strong Saccharomyces cerevisiae products for primary fermentation. And then we have a whole range of Enococcus eni uh, to help winemakers complete their malolactic fermentation. We at Guzmer and Christian Hansen like to think about the winemaking process as three distinct fermentations. The pre-alcoholic fermentation is completed uh, by the non-saccharomyces yeast. You have the rise and fall, the incoming microflora. Once you have some ethanol produced, Saccharomyces cerevisiae dominates and completes the alcoholic fermentation. And then finally, if you are conducting a sequential inoculation, you have your Enococcus eni carrying out the malolactic fermentation. Our yeast and bacteria products can help prevent the growth of undesirable flora, protecting the quality of your wine and helping you achieve your goals. That's why we have a number of resources here in North America for you. The Guzmer Wine website is a great place to go. Uh, you can access their catalog uh, where there's a wealth of information on our 
smell lactic bacteria cultures. And they have a number of resources that your reps can provide you on the right there as a one pager on, on our range, letting uh, you know what particular strain may work in your wine. And now I get the opportunity to introduce my colleague, Natalia Edwards. Natalia Edwards is a senior application manager in Copenhagen. She is focused on enology, and she's also developing new concepts for other fermented beverages, such as ciders and fermented tea. So without further ado, I will let Natalia take it away. Thank you, David. And so now to the more technical part of the presentation here, digging into the malolactic fermentation. I guess that a lot of you already know what the malolactic fermentation are, all of you, but just to recap of it, it's the conversion of malic acid to lactic acid and a little bit of CO2. It's an enzymatic co conversion and it's performed by lactic acid bacteria. And I think it's also important to remember that the reason the bacteria are doing it is not for our sake, but they're actually doing it so they can survive in this environment they've been put into. If you look at it from the wine's perspective, we use the malolactic fermentation to soften the acid profile, and we also use it to modulate a bit the aromatic profile of the wine. The most common spoken about uh, compound when it comes to aromas is the diacetyl and malolactic fermentation, but actually uh, the unococcus and some of the other strains that can be used for lact non lactic fermentation can also produce some different esters and actually affect the fruit profile of it. Then, of course, there is the enhancing of microbial stability of the wine, which is the core reason for doing non lactic fermentation and historically why it happens. So all of this happens in the very harsh environment of wine, so that requires some very robust bacteria. And not only does it require some robust bacteria, it also requires a lot of them. So that's why we have this number we call the magic number, which is 1 times 10 to the 6 CFU per mil. So that's the amount of unococcus cells that you need in your wine before they start the malolactic fermentation. So what I want to show in this slide is an experiment from Australia in a Cabernet. You see this fairly standard parameters. It's a pH of 3.4, ethanol around 13. We divided the tank up to three different tanks and had some different approaches to the malolactic fermentation. So on the far right, you see the spontaneous approach. So just letting the indigenous uh, flora grow up and do the malolactic fermentation. So looking close at it, you have the dark blue line. That is the unococcus CFU. And you can see the numbers on the left of the graph. And then you have the lighter blue line, which is the malic acid. So you can see that the Unococcus is growing, 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 and growing, and on day 30, it hasn't actually reached the magic number, which is shown with the red line, which is 1 times 10 to the 6th. So it also equals quite well, we're not seeing any malolactic fermentation happening, and that's after 30 days of waiting. Then we have the cross-seeding. So this approach is actually taking from the tank that's, the tank that's well going and happening, and we cross-seed, we take some of the wine, we put over in it, so this is an approach where you know that you have some active cells, but you are still not getting the magic number when you start and you do the cross-seeding. So we see here that we start with 1 times 10 to the fifth, and around after two weeks or so, we have enough uh, to actually get to the magic number, and we see the malolactic fermentation is starting. So after 25 days, it's going, it's nearly complete, but it's actually not complete yet. Then we have the version with direct inoculation with our culture. And we see here that as soon as you inoculate, you get more than the magic number. And this secures that you have an immediate onset of the malolactic fermentation. And we see here that it's actually completed in 20 days. So what we have is 20 days to complete with a direct inoculation of unifloral culture. We have the cross seeding at day 25, not completely done, but getting there. And then we have the spontaneous when nothing has happened after 30 days. So what we always secure with our range is that you get the magic number every time. So you can rely on a fast start of the malolactic fermentation. Just to dig a little bit deeper into the spontaneous malolactic fermentation. So this is the traditional way, you could say, of doing malolactic fermentation, that you use the indigenous bacteria. Um, 
if you have healthy bacteria and well controlled, that can work very well. But there is a bit of some pitfalls and some risks that you need to be aware of if choosing this approach. And it can kind of be divided up into two different segments. So if we start with the lower pH uh, wines, so less than pH 3.5, it will mainly be Unococcus uh, doing the work. This can be a quite slow process because as you saw in the slide before, they actually need to grow up to this so-called magic number. If we look into the higher pH wines, here's some other risks that we start introducing because there we can expect that it's not only Unococcus doing the work, but it could also be Pedococci and Lactobacilli. So that can give you a fast more lactic fermentation, but it can be happening in the juice or during the alcoholic fermentation the first days, leading to early issues of, for example, VA and them changing their metabolism because as I mentioned in the first slide, they want to survive. So if there's no more malic acid left, they'll go for the sugars. So just looking a little bit into the risky business of spontaneous, as we call it, uh, you have very little control. I think everyone knows that. You can have variability in speed, that may be okay, but you also have this risk of increased VA production, especially in the higher pH wines, and then something that sometimes is forgotten, and that is the biogenic amine risk. Uh, so the main reason for biogenic amines in wine is lactic acid bacteria. So if you really want to fight this issue, you need to know exactly what bacteria you're adding. And by using ours, we ensure that they cannot produce the biogenic amines. The most, um, well, I would say, allergenic one is the histamine, uh, which you've probably heard of in other foods and people can be allergic to. That's also why they react to it in wine. And I'll dig a little bit more into that in one of my next slides. Then, of course, we have uh, that you can be bottling a little bit too early and sulfur too low and you could have CO2 in the bottles. That's, of course, not very nice. Um, and then you have the opportunity of spoilage. So if you remember the last slide and the figure to the far right where the spontaneous, where we had these 30 days where we're just waiting. So you're potentially keeping the wine at a nice temperature, let's say around 25 degrees, and you're leaving it in this open window, you can't solve it. This is what we call the risk zone, where you can have contamination of undesired uh, microbes, acetic acid bacteria, botrytis, or unococcus or other lactic acid bacteria you don't want in there. And this can give you unwanted sensory flavors. So just a little bit more about the histamine. So histamine is a biogenic amine, uh, and it's the most allergenic effect of the mole. It's produced from histidine, so an amino acid, and we can't avoid that being in the wine. It will always be there. And what it actually is, it, it is something we have in our body. It is a neurotransmitter that's in our body helping us to regulate different physiological functions. But if it gets out of balance, then we can get a reaction to that, and that's why some people can get headaches or get nauseas or reddening or itching, all these reactions to an unbalance in the histamine uh, regulation. And the reason that people get this a lot easier with wine than other foods where you could also have histamine in, uh, like salamis or something like that, is the because there's ethanol present. And the way that we break down ethanol, we're using the same enzyme that we use to regulate the histamine. So that's why we get completely out of balance, which is low amounts of histamine in the wine. So uh, Ethanol is enhancing the effect of the histamine, and that's why it is very important that you control or monitor that you're not getting histamine in your wines. And I think most of us will know people that say they can't, they're allergic to red wines, they can't drink it, and in most cases, this is due to the histamine. So now digging into Unococcus and understand, understanding the very hard life that it lives. So Unococcus can survive and perform our lactic fermentation under these very stressful conditions that we find in the wine. Uh, the main stress factors that we have in there is acid, it's sulfur, of course, it's ethanol, and it's temperature. And all of these have a synergistic effect. So that means that they can actually enhance each other's effect. So if you have two stress factors that are on the edge of what the strain can handle, that can be too much for it. So always remember that there's this synergistic effect between these four things. It should be mentioned that it can also be other things that can inhibit malolactic fermentation or make it harder for it, but these four are the main ones to look for. So if we dig into the pH, we have tried to divide it up a bit and say if you have a pH lower than 3, then you have a very difficult condition for malolactic fermentation. 
If you're in the range of 3 to 3.2, it's, it's difficult but manageable. If we're going between 3.2 to 3.7, that's favorable, and higher than that, that's very favorable. Then to the sulfur, if we have more than 45 ppm of total sulfur, this is getting very difficult for the strains. And as we go lower, it gets easier and easier. And if we are below 30 ppm, we will call this favorable conditions. Then to the ethanol. Um, ethanol is also toxic to unococcus, and especially if it gets up in the higher range. So, but if we have less than 13, we're saying this is actually favorable conditions for unococcus. They don't mind it so much. If you're in between 13 to 15, it starts to get difficult. If you go over 15, then it's, it is becoming very difficult, but it can be managed. An interesting fact here is also actually that unococcus is so adapted to ethanol. Ethanol that we use as a disinfectant and to get rid of most microbes, and especially lactic acid bacteria in very low dosages. But for the unococcus, it needs, it's only at around 8% alcohol that it actually has any impact on the cell. So before that, ethanol has no stress impact on the cells at all. And that's actually one of the reasons that co-inoculation can be favorable if you have a Y and that you know is stressful in two or three of the other issues. And then to the temperature, and this is, a, I think, maybe one of the overseen factors sometimes. Uh, because we have the thing that the wine can be too cold. So if you're less than uh, 59 degrees Fahrenheit, it can be very slow and it can actually be too cold for the strain to do the malolactic fermentation. If you're in between uh, 59 and 66 degrees Fahrenheit, it's not favorable, but doable. If you go from 66 to 77, this is the favorable range. And then comes the interesting part, that if you go over 77 degrees Fahrenheit, it actually starts to become difficult and potentially impossible to do the malolactic fermentation, and especially when combined with higher ethanol. So the synergistic effect of ethanol and high temperature is really lethal for the cells. Um, so this is something to remember. So it's not only about the conditions and choosing the right strain, that is the, my main message, but it's also then you need to think about what's the right timing for you and for your wine. And that's very important. So all our strains can actually be used for co-inoculation or for sequential. It really depends on your wine and your application and what you want to do with it. However, there are some conditions that we say are more favorable for one thing and some that are more favorable for other. So, just to let's define what early co-inoculation is, we call that approximately 24 hours after the yeast. Uh, this is something we would say that you do in difficult conditions. And then we have the late co-inoculation, which is during the alcoholic fermentation, kind of around two-thirds of it is done or more. Um, you can inoculate at that point and give the cells a chance to kind of adapt to the conditions that are in there and then slowly start the malolactic fermentation. So I just wanted to also show this overview, just so we know what we're talking about here. So when we're talking co-inoculation, as I mentioned in the previous slide, we see two different strategies. We see the early co-inoculation, where you only have t around 24 hours between the yeast and then the bacteria. Then we have the late co-inoculation, where we, at the end of the alcoholic fermentation, inoculate the bacteria. Then we have sequential. We would say that we should only be working with the first sequential one, which is immediately after alcoholic fermentation, you inoculate your unococcus. But we do also see people that go for the other option, which we call a delayed sequential inoculation. So that could be the scenario that I showed before, that you've been waiting 30 days or more. It could also be potentially be several months and nothing has happened. And then you decide to inoculate the bacteria. Um, and this is giving you the, this risk zone for contamination, so we really don't recommend that approach, but it is out there. And then there's reverse. I'm not going to dig so much deeper into that. Um, that's mainly done with lactobacillus, but also done in areas of like Germany where they have very harsh conditions and they go for this approach. So we've tried to make some guidelines. This is really guidelines, and it also depends on the wine, as I said, and where you want to go with it. But so the first things you need to look into is, of course, 
your pH, um, is it high, is it low? Your malic acid, you also need a certain amount of malic acids to be consumed. If you have very low malic acid, there's no reason, or it can potentially be a bit dangerous to do too early of a co-inoculation, because then it will be using the malic acid fast, and it will be left with only the sugars, and there you have your VA production. Of course, potential ethanol, if you are, yeah, if you can see that your wine is going for high ethanol levels, co-inoculation could be a very good approach because that could help adapt the cells before you reach your high ethanol, let's say around maybe 16% or something like that. Uh, you need to be sure that you have a good management of your temperature because what we don't want is the temperature going too high. As I showed earlier, if we go above 70, 70 degrees um, Fahrenheit, you really need to be sure when this is happening and that this is not going to kill your unococcus. And finally, and most importantly, if you do have a history of this particular block or being or other or blend having issues with the alcoholic fermentation, then don't go for co-inoculation. That would be too risky. Um, but you can see this little table uh, that we've prepared. So the first three is with the high uh, alcohol, so more than 14% alcohol. And then we've divided it out with lower pH, less than 3.4, and then intermediate pH, 3.4 to 3.7, and then the higher pH. So you can see the harder the condition, so if we have the combination of high ethanol and low pH, early co-inoculation could be a very good approach to go for. If you have more normal pH conditions, but you are expecting high ethanol, late co-inoculation could be a very good approach. On the other hand, if you do have the high pH, we would always recommend that you go for sequential inoculation, because otherwise it's simply too risky and too big of a chance for high VA production. The bottom of the table, you're seeing the lower um, alcohol wines. And again, we've divided into the three different pH categories. If you have low alcohol and you have low pH, early or late co-inoculation could be a good solution. If you are in the intermediate pH range, it will be late co-inoculation or sequential that should be your approach. But again, are you in the higher pH? Sequential is, is, should be your approach. But always remember to be aware of this temperature, that your temperature preferably shouldn't go above 77 degrees Fahrenheit. And if it does, it shouldn't be when the alcohol is high. And by high, you know, rule of thumb, if it's more than 10, 11 degrees, you should be wary of uh, the temperature. And that's degrees alcohol, of course. Now to the most important thing, selecting the right strain. This is really crucial. Because as I said, it's a hard environment, and we have tried to select different strains of unococcus from around the world uh, that fit different environments that have been over centuries adapted to this specific environment being low pH or high ethanol. So they are strong in that environment. You put them in the wrong environment, you won't get the effect that you should have had. They may adapt to it, they may work, but you're not going to get the speed, you're not going to get what you're expecting. And in worst case, it may not work. We may be completely off where it should be working. So this is the table of um, the strains that uh, we supply for you in the US, where you can see we've tried to cover most wine conditions. So at the top, we have our UNOS strains. Uh, these strains really do cover most wines. But if you do have more of a special case, for example, you have a low pH, or you know that you can't really control the temperature so well, or you want to keep it at lower temperatures, we would make it in CH11, which is um, isolated from Germany, so it's good at these low pH conditions. On the other hand, if you're in the case of having a high ethanol, we recommend that you go for CH16. So this strain can tolerate up to 16% ethanol. Then we have CH35, uh, which has kind of two different approach uses. So it is the most sulfur tolerant strain we have. So if you're in a situation where you have higher sulfur than you expected, or you have a very high sulfur producing saccharomyces, CH35 would be the best approach because it's, it's kind of, I call it the tank. So in these very tough conditions of sulfur being the worst of uh, the stresses, because this is really lethal for most cells, the CH35 will get through it. It will plow through anything. But another thing about the CH35 is that it's also high in diacetyl production. 
So if you're going for a wine with, for example, a Chardonnay with these buttery characters, CH35 is your go-to strain. Um, and then in the completely opposite range, we have the Viniflora Senior. So Sina stands for citrate negative, and that means that this strain cannot take up citric acid. And what does that then mean for your wine? That's what I'm going to dig into in the next two slides. So this is the citric acid metabolism found in Unococcus. So they take up citric acid, and from this they produce tongue acid salt, which we know as the buttery characters in wine. What we know for the Sina is that it cannot take up citric acid. So you're not, you don't have the citric acid entering into the cell, but to be completely safe, we also make sure that it can't even, it can't do this process, this uh, metabolism. It's knocked out in this cell. So just to show an example of it, that this is true. So it would do the malolactic fermentation, but will not produce any diacetyl. So here we have a wine where we have, um, on the far right, we have the controls that this is without any uh, malolactic fermentation, and we see no diacetyl. Then we have with CH11, medium level of diacetyl. And then we have Sina, which is completely similar to no MLF, with no diacetyl produced. And then in the opposite range, we have CH35, our high diacetyl producer, with a high level of diacetyl. So this strain is now widely, it's been on the market for 10 years now, and it is widely used in whites and in rosés, where you want to have a different acid balance, so kind of balancing out having not too much malic acid, going for this more lactic acid profile, making it milder and softer, but without getting diacetyl and keeping these fruit flavors. It's also very used in the trends of lowering sulfur, because if you start lowering sulfur in your white and your rosé, it becomes really difficult to manage that you don't have malolactic fermentation in the bottles later. But by using CNE, you've kind of eliminated that risk because you've made sure it's happened, but you haven't sacrificed the fruity flavors. So this is the trial from uh, Southern Rhone, as you can see. It's a blend of Rosanne and Marsanne. Um, and here we tried again to show the flavor effect that Unococcus actually does have on a wine. Uh, when we think about modulating the flavor of our wine, we know we have the grapes and we know that we have the yeast is the main character we think of. But actually, it's worth also giving it a little bit of thought of what Unococcus you use. So here, it's the same wine divided into three. And we can see that the scene, that's red bars, by this sensory panel in, um, in France, that was rated with a lot of fruity characters. So they rated it high in pineapple, mango, grapefruit, also actually on peppery characters, uh, which is common to the varieties. And then when we look at the CH35 tank, it's the completely opposite. We're looking at the buttery, the milky, the roasted flavors. It's a more full-bodied. We also have the honey in the middle uh, of the graph, which is an attribute found in CH35, but not found in the wine made with Dina. So now I wanted to dig into a little bit about how we actually work at Christian Hansen. Um, and first I wanted to share with you that all our strains are isolated from nature. So we do find them all in wine environments. That could be grapes in the vineyard, it can be in the mast, it can be in the fermenting wine. Everything is found, originates from wine that we sell for the wine industry. And we do constantly look for new strains. So when we see that there are constantly new issues and requirements that our customers are asking for, we continuously looking for new strains, for new products that can help in different things. So that can be enhancing some specific flavors. It can be going for climate changes and adapting to those conditions that we're foreseeing in the future, bioprotection, all of this. Um, and to do that, we work together with universities, research centers, but we also actually do go out ourselves and isolate strains sometimes. Now into the production. So as David mentioned in the beginning, uh, we have uh, production in different countries. We have production in Denmark, in Germany, and France, and in the US. And this really secures that we also have a mobile production site where we can always move the production from country to country where the demand is. Um, and make, in a situation like this, if a country should close down, we can always change it. So we can ensure a good supply chain. 
These are some pictures from our uh, production. And if you look at the one on the far right, you probably recognize these tanks. It really does look like fermentation tanks. And that is because we are actually conducting fermentations, kind of. We are just looking at the biomass. So we are looking at growing cells and make sure that we grow healthy cells, active cells, and cells that can handle later the direct inoculation. After we've grown them up, we need to make them in the format that we can actually send out to the whole world, including you guys. And that's where we have the frozen format and the freeze dried. But actually, all of it goes to freezing first. So we always start with the frozen culture. And that's the picture on the left. They get frozen in these small pellets. Um, but then with some of them will also go further for the freeze drying. And you can see these are our big freeze dryers that we use for it. Then to the storage. So we have some cultures that need to be stored very cold, as some of you may know, our frozen cultures. So therefore, we actually have Europe's largest uh, minus 67 degree Fahrenheit freezer, uh, which is this massive room where we store all our cultures. You'll also notice that the guy packing it, this is not a corona outfit he's wearing. This is the normal outfit for being in the packing area, because we really need to make sure that the environment is clean, we don't want any contamination, we want clean and pure products. And this is probably based on our history of producing dairy cultures where it's really essential to have a clean product. And we carry this over for our whole, all our production range for whatever application it may be, wine, meat or beer. Then for the use, so if you go for our frozen products, they need to be stored in a minus 49 degrees Fahrenheit freezer. If you go for the freeze dryer, that can be stored in a normal freezer, and they have a shelf life of two years. And how you use our cultures? Well, we like to keep it simple in the way that we want to make sure it's simple when it gets to you guys. Therefore, all of our malactic cultures are direct inoculation. That means you open the bag and you simply pour it in. So certifications and all of that. We don't just create the products for you and sell that. We also can supply full insurance of hazard processes. And we can, on demand, uh, supply you with documents that you need. It can be safety sheets, specifications, different certificates, allergens. We've also recently got a certificate for kosher on all of our wine products. And if you have anything specific you need, just reach out to your customer rep, and they'll contact us, and we'll make sure that you can get that. So we have all of this ready to help you guys if you need it. So digging a little bit more into the quality, uh, if we start with that fact that all our strains, before we actually think about making it into a product, they need to go through an extensive quality control. So the first thing that we check for is that the strains are not antibiotic resistant and that they don't produce biogenic amines. And back to the biogenic amines, this is the pathway that you would normally find or you would find in some uh, lactic acid bacteria that they can convert histidine into histamine. We ensure that our strains do not have this pathway, so they simply can't produce your biogenic amines. Then to the quality control of each batch. So what we do is after each batch, we check that you have viable cells. Uh, we do that with flow cytometry and cell counts on plates. We also have this MAC test, which is a unique test for Christian Hansen. It's an accelerated malactic conversion uh, where we ensure that the cells are not only viable, but they're actually active when it comes to converting malic acid, which is why you guys are buying them. Also, we have a very extensive contamination analysis um, where we go above and beyond what is actually required. And this is just to show you the list of what we check before it goes out. So back to the application. Um, malolactic fermentation isn't always easy, and you do sometimes have is issues with stuck malolactic fermentation. So we've tried to make this troubleshooting list. So if we start on the left, the first thing would be always to check the temperature, because this is something, again, it, it can be forgotten after alcoholic fermentation. You kind of, OK, we're good. But just check that the temperature is in the right range that's favorable for malolactic fermentation. But if it, your temperature is right and you can answer no to that one, you can go on and you can say, OK, is the pH too low? And if you say yes to that, or maybe you need to re-inoculate with CH11, which is our most pH tolerant strain. If it's a no to that, OK, is it maybe the sulfur that's too high? And if it's a yes to that, you can go for, and 
inoculate our sulfur tolerant strain, the CH35. And again, if you say, no, my sulfur is in range, it's fine. Well, then we get to the nutrients. And this um, is often not so talked about, but actually the unococcus also does require some nutrients. Like all other living organisms, they need nitrogen and vitamins to actually make the enzymes that they need to actually stay alive. So therefore, there needs to be some form of nutrients in the wine. But they don't actually require the same nutrients as the yeast. So for example, your DAP cannot be used by the bacteria. The bacteria, they want amino acids. And preferably, they actually want smaller peptides, which is not favored by most yeast. So in many cases, it will be left over. But if not, you can add um, nutrients for malactic uh, bacteria. We have Bactivate. I know that Gusma has another product that can help you with that. But please always remember to choose a nutrient that is for uh, malactic bacteria because they do have special requirements. But if you actually your nutrient levels are fine, well, then you can start checking the population. Has something gone wrong? Do I need to re-inoculate? If you answer no, I haven't, my population is fine. Well, then it may be the alcohol level, and there you can switch strains again to the alcohol tolerance C16 if required. And then if it's still a no to that, well, then we have what is the malic acid too low? And this sounds a bit weird because the whole idea with malolactic fermentation is getting rid of the malic acid. But there's also this weird phenomenon that, that if you have less than one gram per liter of malic acid, it can actually be pretty hard to start the malolactic fermentation. So it kind of needs a certain amount for it to kickstart the process. So an approach there could be adding a bit of malic acid so you get over the one gram and that will um, should help you start the malolactic fermentation. Finally, there are other inhibitors that can be in the wine. There are some polyphenols, there are some toxic compounds that can be produced by the yeast. And there's also fatty acids that can be produced, um, smaller fatty acids, med oh, sorry, medium chain fatty acids that can be inhibitory uh, for the malolactic cultures. And there, this can be different approaches. Um, it, can also, it can be yeast holes to get rid of the medium chain fatty acids. It cannot actually also be PBPP. We've found to work sometimes for very hard wines from our lactic fermentation. So management of malactic fermentation can actually solve a lot of different quality issues in the wine. We recently did a um, questionnaire uh, for different wineries and traders and bottlers to like what is the main quality issues that they found in wine. So either they're producing or buying or selling or what they're doing. And we thought it was really interesting when digging into that that we find quite a lot of them could be handled if you had a proper management of your malactic fermentation. So the first one that comes is the high VA. I think that's pretty obvious why we can help with that. But then there's also other things. So we have uh, at the bottom down here, we have the one MLF in white, so where it wasn't wanted. And then finally, at the bottom of it, we have the mousiness. And this could potentially also be handled if you have a proper management of malolactic fermentation. Then MLF getting a population into the wine. We do know that there's different approaches to malolactic fermentation, and we've tried to list them here. So going from spontaneous down to direct inoculation, we've kind of ranked them in the amount of control that you really do have. So if you look at the arrows on the right, you see that the risk is increasing when you go up. So spontaneous is the most risky, direct inoculation the least. And then the perceived cost. But you really have to think, is this actually the cost? What's the what are the benefits? Because you are getting a lot of benefits of a fast malolactic fermentation, and potentially you can solve some of the issues you saw on the slide before, or some of the other things I've been talking about. Finally, I want to mention that really do think about the timing. You could, if you have a wine that fits co-inoculation, you could get some benefits out of uh, choosing that approach. You can be saving time. You can also be saving heat, so saving costs on that way. And um, you can make sure that you adapt your unococcus if you high, have a high ethanol wine. I would say this is often a very good area to start exploring co-inoculation, that if you know you have a high ethanol wine coming for you. Um, and finally, when you do co-inoculation, we ensure that we completely close this risk window of contamination. So you really 
um, decreasing your risk of any spoilage organisms getting in there. And then also it has been found that co-inoculation does give you a more fruity wine and less diacetyl production if that's the direction you want to go for. So final comment is here, this is just an overview of the different strains that we have in our range and most importantly choose the right strain for your wine um, and then consider all the rest afterwards. And remember that all our products are for direct inoculation and we always ensure that you get the magic number if using them as we recommend. So thank you very much and for more information there's of course you can contact Christian Hansen but I would recommend that you contact GASMA when you're in the US um, and they will help you with your questions. So now for questions right now and I heard that a lot of things were incoming so I'm looking forward to the questions. All right, thank you Natalia, that was a great presentation. Okay, I'm going to start my video as they come in. The first question Natalia is which of the wine bacteria are available in freeze-dried form and for shelf life? Uh, so I'll, I'll let you answer that first question, which of the wine bacteria are available in freeze-dried form? And then uh, Lerm, if you could just clarify uh, what you mean by for shelf life question mark. Yes, so all of our, if we go back to the range, all of our bacteria are available as a freeze-dried and frozen form. Okay. Um, while Lerm is uh, clarifying his question on shelf life, Ping says, can you talk about how agitation and oxygen affect male lactic fermentation? Oh, that's a good question. So oxygen will get the bacteria to go more towards the growing environment. So actually, if you do have an issue with a malolactic fermentation that's not started, a little bit of oxygen can be a good idea. Of course, you don't want to, um, to add too much, so you start oxidizing the wine. But if you have the option of just sparging a little bit in there or just having a bit of agitation in the tank, that can actually be beneficial to kickstart the malolactic fermentation. Okay. Uh, another question about CH35. Should you avoid co-inoculation co-inoculation with diacetyl enhancing CH35? No, I wouldn't say that. Actually, I think CH35 is a good strain for the co-inoculation uh, practice. Um, and if you want the diacetyl, it will still be produced there. You may have less um, because it will be a faster process, but you'll still have a higher diacetyl than if you chose another strain. Okay. Question about mouthfeel. What differences in mouthfeel texture effects do the different products have? Uh, that's a very good question. I have to say we haven't looked thoroughly into the mouthfeel effect of the individual strains, um, but they can be producing slight amount of mouthfeel characters and polysaccharides, but it's not really something you can see a significant impact on, I would say. Got it. And from you know a commercial point of view, you know I know that this presentation was just focused in on our Enococcus eni strains, um, but they are not. That's not the only tool a winemaker has in their toolbox. Uh, certainly can use a number of other uh, processes or ingredients to help you get there. Uh, the one that I think of first, uh, perhaps, is the use of a non-Saccharomyces yeast like Prelude, that Torstor del Bruchii, uh, that can help you build that mouthfeel uh, on the front end. Natalia, I believe there was a, a few questions that came in before the presentation about co-inoculation versus sequential inoculation and uh, if you have any preferences or if Christian Hansen or Gosmer have any preferences. I believe that you know it's really up to the winemaker what they're trying to achieve uh, their particular wine. Uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, when a winemaker is trying to decide between sequential and co-inoculation? Yes, so the first thing I'd like to emphasize is it's really important to remember that co-inoculation is not so much strain related. So it's not that the strains are made for the one or the other. They can all be used for co-inoculation or sequential. It's more about the wine conditions. And I think it's when you have a wine that could be potentially difficult to do your malolactic fermentation in, that's when you should start thinking co-inoculation could be a good idea. 
If you, on the other hand, have a wine with some fairly easy conditions, uh, so a high pH being one of them, um, then I would for sure not go towards um, co-inoculation. I'd always choose sequential. So more thinking of it's difficult, then co-inoculation is a good idea. If it's too easy, then it's a bad idea. It's more if you're in the middle, you can start thinking about the style and how fast you need the malolactic fermentation. Do you want it more fruity or do you want more diacetyl produced? So it's more in the mid-range that you can consider it. And you should look at your wine, what fits it the best. Um, but I would say the late co-inoculation is a really good tool for a lot of wines uh, because you kind of give the chance the bacteria a kickstart with just adapting slowly. And then when the alcoholic fermentation is ending, your malactic fermentation is already going. So you're not in that window section. Okay. Thank you. Another question coming in about malolactic fermentation in barrels. Is it ideal to have zero headspace in barrels during malolactic fermentation? Yes, if you have a good enough, if you inoculate the right strain and the, con the rest of the conditions are good, then yes, that's fine. The CO2 you're producing is, is very low amounts. But the question before about the oxygen or the agitation, so maybe if you do have a condition that can be a little bit hard, and some stirring could be useful, then of course completely filling the tank. Oh, the, sorry, the barrel would be a, a bad idea. Okay, I got a, I got a great question uh, about a slow and steady malactic conversion. I, I have a lot of discussions about this with with winemakers and and what we believe. To play off that last question, some winemakers feel a slow and steady. Malactic conversion offers more positive textures versus a quick malactic conversion. Can you comment on this? Yeah, but that's the thing. As you say, there's a lot of different opinion, and it's very fast. Some winemakers can't get it fast enough and think that's the best, and others say, oh, it, it can't be too fast. And I think that is really the individual wine style, and depending on your wine, what you think suits that. There's not one unique answer to it. Yeah. Okay. We have a question about BA and diacetyl. As bacteria producing diacetyl, it also produces VA. I think we're talking about CH35. Is there a mm -hmm. way to minimize VA while maximizing diacetyl? Okay. So let's go back to my diacetyl side. I know it's maybe a bit behind you guys here. That is a good question, how you actually minimize. We don't encounter that people have issues with it. We also need to remember that acetic acid can also go further and be metabolized into other things. So I think it's if you have a slow and steady malolactic fermentation, it's not really a major issue. Um, so that could be the answer of it, I would say, that we're doing it because it's happening slowly. It's not evolving into a problem, and the acetic acid can react to other things on the way. Right. Does that answer the question? Yeah, well, I think that's something that we can continue to get feedback for yeah. the winemakers uh, out there and talking to their reps if, if they are yeah. looking to produce a lot of diacetyl but are finding that... And we also we need to remember that the citric acid concentrations we have in the wine is very low. So the acetic acid we're producing here will be very low amounts, whereas the acetic acid that could potentially be produced from the sugars is a lot higher potential like that can be done with because there's a lot of sugars there. So yeah. we are talking of very small levels of acetic acid. It's just a, a small byproduct of this reaction. Yeah. You know, I, I remember um, at some of my former employees and at, at university, uh, we would do experiments where we added citric acid to boost the diacetyl, and we did run into that issue when adding extra citric acid that we would increase the, the VA. So a very yeah. interesting point. We'd love to get more feedback from the industry to see uh, without adding additional citric acid, you know, are you um, finding that your VA levels are higher uh, than uh, a place you would want them? And also because the diacetyl is a more potent compound. So we're seeing over here that it's PPB we're measuring it in, and we know that this is very high diacetyl. This is something you can actually feel in the wine. So I think there's also that, that it's not as potent, your acetic acid. Right. So the okay. small concentrations you're producing here is not significant. All right, we have a question about lees and its effect on malolactic fermentation. 
How does lees affect malolactic fermentation? Is it beneficial to keep ML lees or should racking be done as soon as it's finished? That's a very good question. That can go both ways. So the lees is good in the way that it can actually give you the nutrients that you need for your malic lactic fermentation, but it can also be hiding some inhibitory effects. So that's something where you kind of have to go with it. I would say yes, normally lees is a good idea, but there would be some cases where it's more damaging than beneficial. And then you could maybe potentially take out that lees and add only a little bit of that lees or add a lees from a wine that has a a healthy environment for malolactic fermentation or add other nutrients. Got it. Okay. I have a good question about some winemakers who may be producing wine in very large tanks and very large quantities. Have you seen hydrostatic pressure effect on bacteria growth like large production tank with high height to diameter ratio? I'd have to say I don't have a lot of experience with tanks that have had that big a size that it would actually have an inhibitory effect. I'd say maybe, David, you know more about that with, with your background. Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't have the, the data to, to back it up on you know, hydrostatic pressure and, and how it has an effect on bacteria growth. Uh, our, the winemaking teams that I have been part of haven't been uh, that sophisticated, but I've, you know, personally, have fermented wine in 200 ton, 100 ton tanks, um, and they go into 350,000 gallon, 600,000 gallon tanks. And I was consistently able to uh, get a conversion, you know, within two weeks with the Christian Hansen product line. Uh, so I, I don't have data to, to back it up. But you know, definitely from anecdotal evidence, uh, certainly uh, the Christian Hansen strains can perform well at the largest tank size that I can can imagine in in the industry. Uh, but certainly something that you know for further exploration. Yeah. So it's, I would say it isn't a question. It isn't a problem that we've heard many times that people have had. Um, and if it is, I think it will be more a lack of maybe oxygen in there. So maybe a bit of sparging with oxygen agitation just to give them something would help if you run into that issue. Yeah. One of the things that you mentioned that I know a couple of people have really expressed a lot of interest is how the bacteria is produced. You know, it seems very complicated. It seems very far away from how winemakers uh, think. But when you showed those pictures, it is truly a fermentation. They look like wine fermentation tanks, but you said the focus is on mass instead of alcohol production. Is that true? Yes. The focus is on creating biomass. So our whole focus is how can we get them to grow the best possible so we can get a lot of cells in there. But not only that, the whole science actually lies in making good and strong bacteria so as I also mentioned, all our products are for direct inoculation. So it's the balance that we need to, we want to create a lot of cells in that tank, but we also want to have good and healthy and strong cells and that are adapted to the different wine conditions that they're going to encounter. Right. But yes, it is fermentation tanks. <laughs> but it's just creating the right conditions for them. And then having it very, very clean. Coming from the wine industry and seeing those tanks, it's a, it's a different world. Well, that, those are all the questions that we have today. I'm going to end it here. Thank you so much, Natalia. Pleasure. And, and have a good day, everyone over there. Excellent. And you know, any customers, any questions, reach out to your local rep. Go to guzmerwine.com and you can find all the resources uh, you need.